see what other stuff is here. These are things that you download or copy onto your memory card. Oh, okay, so it, it did it. Extra bike, panda bear costume, surfing H30, what the hell is that? H3L, I guess? Maybe that's how it's supposed to be pronounced. All characters unlocked. Press room. Dark cloud. Oh, dark cloud. You know, a lot of people are down on the original dark cloud. On a peaceful, clear summer wasn't, night, uh, the village of Laroon is bathed under the illumination of two moons. Music floating from below, the villagers uh, dance in celebration of the harvest festival. A lot of talking here, and none of this has jack shit to do with the game. Suddenly, <laughs> a dark cloud appears from nowhere, bringing with it an unimaginable Okay, this thing. does. In one fell swoop, the village is gone. An ancient evil has been unleashed. This epic journey unfolds within the mysteries of myths and fairy tales. Would you be able to revive and restore this world? After the destruction of the Western continent, our main character, Toan, awakens to total Toan, darkness. really? An old man appears before him and introduces himself as the Spirit Emperor. The Spirit Emperor bestows a great responsibility on Toan, a young man with a pure heart. He must now rebuild the world that has crumbled before him. Toan's village has been destroyed by these evil beings. To rebuild them, you must first collect the various parts of the towns that have been dispersed to different dungeons, and you put them back together. As you do so, the townspeople are released, and in return, reward you. The rewards lead you to your next adventure. This world-building system, which the game's creators have named the Georama system, is perhaps the most innovative feature in Dark Cloud. Being able to build your own world and interact with it in real time is extremely fun. And we wanted to combine this new feature with a very popular genre like an RPG so that we could build an incredibly deep and robust game for gamers everywhere. You begin building by using an overhead view to arrange the different elements in the village. You then can decide to immediately begin interacting with the environment and townspeople or continue building the world. There's absolutely no delay. It occurs seamlessly and in real time. Beyond this new Georama system, Dark Cloud delivers the depth and character development that RPG players demand. There are six playable characters available over the course of the game. And as your adventure continues, you will have to carefully manage their development. Various fairy tale themes have been incorporated throughout the game. It is an epic story of good versus evil, a fantasy world filled with genies, talking animals, and magic. And the creators of Dark Cloud claim that only the power of the PlayStation 2 could bring this sweeping story to life. We had grand visions as we began the development of Dark Cloud. There were so many things that we were able to do that we couldn't do before. We've included a lot of realistic details that only the PS2 can allow. It's a dream come true. With its deep and involving storyline, innovative design, and stunning graphics, Dark Cloud sets a new standard for role-playing games on the PlayStation 2. The Dark Cloud was not a deep role-playing game in any real sense. The story was rather simplistic. It was about 
somebody unleashed a genie which was used to destroy the, the cities of the world and all that kind of stuff. And your character's job was to go into these procedurally generated dungeons and retrieve sort of like orbs that held the different buildings and people. Then go back outside and where the real fun of Dark Cloud was involved reassembling these cities. And you could build them in pretty much any way you wanted. The characters had requests on how you they wanted their houses to be set, but once you did it for them once, you can move them, do whatever you feel like with them. But that's what I'd spent a lot of my time doing, was just building new versions of these cities. So there isn't much of a story, but the story was just sort of an excuse to have this sort of uh, customizable town thing. The other... Um, the gameplay portion of combat in the dungeons and all that kind of stuff, like I said before, it was procedurally generated dungeons. Every time you went down there, there was a new layout, so you could memorize your way through. But they all felt kind of samey. And the combat was pretty simplistic, and the RPG mechanics, I think, were pretty light as well. Beyond that, there were a lot of quick time events back before people knew them by that name. So that was a little irritating. I was never, I've never been a fan of quick time events. But moving on to Extermination, an early survival horror game from PlayStation this One. Summer, you will go on a mission deep into the Antarctic where a terrible threat awaits. Fear and danger wait at every turn, a mission that you may not survive. Extermination. From Tokuro Fujiwara and his team at Deep Space, Extermination will take you places you've never been before. Extermination takes place at an underground research Wait a sec, facility what? <laughs> at the South Pole. Because of the extremely Can we just see this guy? They're able to conduct experiments on dangerous viruses. Suddenly, a distress signal is sent from the base, and all communications are cut off. When Dennis Riley and his partners in the Marine Special Forces Red Light Team arrive at the top-secret Antarctic base, they find that infected mutants have taken the base over, and that they are hell-bent on infecting the members of Red Light with their deadly virus. Red Light? Well, there are creatures in the facility that have violently mutated. They spit a green substance, and the infection that they're carrying is spread through that substance. At first, when you become infected with the virus, Take this. you can cure yourself with medicine. You can recover. The antibodies will temporarily ward off infection. But if you get 100% infected, you can't cure yourself with the regular vaccine anymore. You need to find a treatment pod. When you're infected, your body gets eaten away from the inside. Your strength diminishes over time. When you've deteriorated completely, it's game over. mutants, a lethal virus, danger at every turn. Sounds like a classic formula for an action movie. And that's exactly what Deep Space is aimed to create in Extermination. An action movie where the player is immersed into a world where his actions, his fear, and his wits are what control the outcome. We all see tons of films, and they all affect us differently. They move us, or they excite us. So we wanted to make the action in games feel more like a film. We thought that the gameplay would have a better feel to it. You'd get the full flavor and power of it all. So to make this a reality, 
who developed the Region Action System, and I think that clearly distinguishes this game from other action games. With the Region Action System, you control the character's movement with just one button. For example, when you need to jump, hitting the action button will make you jump. If you need to climb, just hit the same button. It makes the control streamlined and easy to use. Resident Evil 4 did the same thing, but probably to a better effect. Point of view, you're closer to being able to react to the game on a split-second gut basis. Other than his teammates, Sergeant Riley has one crucial companion in the Antarctic cold, his advanced, highly customizable assault rifle, the SPR-4. The player can rapidly customize the SPR-4. They can find attachments to make it into a flamethrower, a grenade launcher, or numerous other weapons. From the executive producer of Biohazard and the creator of Mega Man, extermination is the next step forward. You'll be amazed at the realism as weapons experts were called in to work on the project. We worked with Mr. Ichiro Nagata. This man is knowledgeable in military affairs. He writes articles for Combat Magazine, so he's extremely famous in Japan. He not only supervised the parts of the game having to do with guns and other firearms, he gave us all sorts of advice, such as how the characters should handle the weapons, how they should look while they're firing. We even took some of the movement in the game from the demonstrations he gave us. From the detailed weaponry to movie quality cutscenes that lead you through the story to the explosive gameplay, Extermination is a summer blockbuster you won't want to miss. Extermination was not an especially great game. It was alright, but, I mean, survival horror games had been kind of a mainstay for a number of years, and even though it looked better than any of the PlayStation 1 survival horror games, that looks aren't everything. It had a lot of, like, um, features, let's call them innovative if you want, but it didn't work out. It, it ended up being a little bit frustrating. The controls are outdated. It doesn't feel very good to shoot. You can get used to it, of course. It's been a little while since I put any time into playing the game. It was also one of those ones that when it was first unveiled for the PlayStation 2, people looked at it as like, oh, I mean, it looked so much better than what we had seen to the PlayStation 1. So pretty much any game was considered impressive. But it took a while for the game to come out, at least in the United States. So, as its actual release got closer, it sort of um, didn't come across as quite as impressive. So, I think maybe it might have gotten delayed. I'll look it up later. But I remember people's opinion of it sort of going south a bit before it finally released. E3 round up. created with the original team that did Crash Bandicoot and it's our first project on the PlayStation 2 and this game is something that we're really excited about it was developed for a year and a half it's a non-linear gameplay 
and you have various tasks to solve. And as you go forward, you see that there's a very involved story. We have in our world a lot of uh, technology and mystery that has been left behind by the precursors who are somehow involved in creation of this universe. Nobody really knows why it's there, but our main character, Jack, which is what the player controls, is special enough to be able to unlock these mysteries. It's got continuous worlds. There's uh, eight times of day change. There's no load time. At any given time, we're pushing anywhere from uh, 20 to 50 times more polygons than you ever saw in Crash. And the sky's the limit with PlayStation 2. It really is unbelievable the amount of uh, muscle we're getting out of the system. Jack and Daxter, Precursor Legacy. Look for it in stores this holiday season. Jack and Daxter was what uh, was the future of 3D platformers. Unlike all the crap I was talking about earlier. Uh, my name is Richard Fogey. Jack and Daxter uh, actually pulled it off. We're looking at here is Kinetica. It's fast action racing. We already talked about Kinetica during the demo of it. Style of racing where the bikes you think combined with the humans in this sort of an armored suit where the wheels are attached to them so that they're right in there with the speed. And they can all do these high-flying, really acrobatic daredevil stunts as they're racing around on these futuristic tracks. There's multiplayer aspects so you can really get into the competitive nature of the game, really head-to-head -head on the racing. One of the key things for any racing game is keeping the frame rate really solid. When the final game ships, 60 across the board, which really makes for a smoother playing experience of the racing game. The player can really get uh, much more control over their racer and much more control over what they're doing. And, and then the, the interaction is better. Kinetica, coming on the PlayStation 2, Fall 2001, check it out. Gran Turismo. Oops, I hit a button. Oh, looks like I can do uh, all these individually. I don't have to watch that whole video. <laughs> Alright, so Jack and Daxter was a 3D platform, an action platformer. And I had said before how early 3D platformers were trash. None of them really hold up. Jack and Daxter... Perhaps the first example of one that does. Jack and Daxter was good then, it's good now. Kinetica, I don't have anything else to say about. Here we go. Drake and Ancient Skate again. Shame they didn't give us more of a view of Gran Turismo. That was something I'd want to talk about. Even though simulation racers aren't really my thing. Hi, I'm Alan Patmore, and I'm the president and lead designer of Surreal Software. Working on Draken 2, which you see behind me. It is a Dracon. first action adventure game where you play Rin, who's a uh, heroic female character, is very athletic. She can engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat, summon spells using a magic system, and then the coolest part is that you can get on Aerok, who is your dragon counterpart, and fly around, take to the skies, and engage in intense aerial combat. It has a great flight dynamic. Uh, we spent a lot of time tuning the flight control, so it's very fluid, and you really feel like you're in flight, but it's yet still very easy to control. And one of the coolest things about the PlayStation 2 is it allows us to render these enormous landscapes. You begin the game after Draken 1 ended, where your brothers died, you're burying the villagers of your town who are laid to waste by hordes of eagle creatures. You're supposed to summon the Dragon Mother, who is the final creature, and she'll help restore peace and tranquility to the rest of the world. Check out Draken Fall 2001. I haven't really played Draken, but it seems like a Interesting or a good game there. So calm, here we go. So calm. So calm US Navy SEALs is a uh, military action game that we're developing for the PlayStation 2. It's a team based game. So, in both single player and multiplayer, the object is to use your teammates in order to accomplish the mission objectives. Another one of the features that we're really excited about with SOCOM is the online capabilities. SOCOM is going to be one of the first games released this fall that supports the Sony analog broadband adapter. You'll be able to connect through the internet to our game servers and be able to join.
joined games with people who are already there. We were also able to work in collaboration with Naval Special Warfare to consult with them and capture what it's like to be a U.S. Navy SEAL. We were also able to go out to the ranges with them and shoot some of the uh, guns. So when you play the game, you're really going to get a feel for the realism and authenticity. SOCOM U.S. Navy SEALs will be available this fall exclusively for the PlayStation 2. Okay, SOCOM U.S. Navy SEALs was released in 2002, so a good, um, what does it say? I just looked it up on my phone, August of 2002, so it's quite a time after this video was made. Um, this is one of the big games that, like, convinced me that I needed to get a PlayStation 2, and I needed to get the goddamn thing online, because I didn't have an internet connection. <laughs> You needed a broadband connection, which is a little bit awkward for a game of that era. But it was a squad-based um, third-person shooter. It had a solo campaign, a, a single-player campaign. They can go through it that I thought was fun and all. And it had a nice little gimmick where you it came with a headset, which I honestly used for quite a number of years. In fact, the early days of this YouTube channel, the microphone I used was the SOCOM microphone, and if you can't tell by the quality of the audio in those episodes, uh, well, but you would be able to issue voice commands to your teammate. Now, it was really nothing that you couldn't have done with controller commands, but it was a gimmick, and you know, gimmicks are important. The online, though, is where I spent most of my time playing it, and it was... It's been so long since I've been able to play SOCOM online, so I can't really judge it fairly. I can't tell if it was actually good or not. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But it was something different for me, because I wasn't a PC gamer, and I didn't have an Xbox when Xbox wasn't even released yet, I don't think. So Xbox Live wasn't really a thing. The GameCube online adapter was useless. So, it was my first opportunity to play games online. This and the EverQuest game that came out for PlayStation 2 were really what I cut my teeth on online gaming with. And it was fantastic in its day. I loved it. I spent so much time playing that. I was actually pretty damn good at it. I would, I would usually win in my online matches. But, uh, you know, enough that. Okage! Okage? Something? I'm still not convinced I actually played this game. <laughs> Sorry there. Hello, I'm Sean Riddick. I'm the assistant producer. Although maybe I did, I don't know. <laughs> Okage? Is that how it's pronounced? I'm pronouncing the name wrong the whole time. Jesus. <laughs> I don't know. Okage will be available late summer, early fall on the PlayStation 2. Okage? Oh, I would not have pronounced it that way. In fact, I didn't. Frequency. Frequency. Oh, this was, um... What? Harmonix, is it called? Harmonix was a studio that's best known for uh, Guitar Hero and Rock Band. Is an online DJing game. It allows and it, you to like you can see that um, friends an existing tune and remix it together online. This is harmonics, so right? Tunnel, each side of the tunnel represents I think this is harmonics that did this. Come down that but you could see like everything was music based. The the so gem. they definitely and had their niche that they as you go along. catered to. You'll be able to go online and meet up with friends and through various Another channels. online game. And actually play the game with four other You know, people. I played this the, before, but I never owned it. Track or a different instrument and play together 
You also have a great remixing function. You connect online via your PlayStation 2. You can actually take an existing song and remix it with your friends all at the same time. Frequency will be available coming this November on PlayStation 2. Yeah, Eco. We played through the demo of Eco, so I don't really have much more to say about this. I'm Ron Allen from Sony Computer Entertainment America. The game behind me is Eco, and it's a third person action adventure game set in a uh, fantasy environment. It's an epic adventure of a boy born with horns who is imprisoned in a castle. Because he has he horns? escapes this imprisonment and tries to find his way out of the castle. On his journey, he finds the princess of the castle, and um, he's actually trying to lead the girl out. This game offers new gameplay, first time ever seen on uh, actually any type of game. You're actually leading a girl all the way through the game. There's a lot of puzzle elements, a lot of uh, action elements as well. There's fighting. We took advantage of the PlayStation 2 technology by... Uh, Using inverse schematics on the hand holding, holding the arms. Oh, Only so in game cutscenes, it's all yeah. real time. There's no PG in this game at all. There's no load times. It's uh, seamlessly together. The streams all the way through the game. For people who like adventure games, this is going to be a great title. It goes coming out on PlayStation 2 this fall. Check it out. All right, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3. The Tony Hawk games were a huge deal in the PlayStation. And I'd say it continued in the PlayStation 2, like, you know, I think the Underground series was on PlayStation 2. Didn't really play those, but I know people well, there, have a real soft Jewett. spot for them. Uh, wow, look at this motherfucker. David, working on Sony Hawk 3 <laughs> for the PlayStation 2. We're doing the online play with the game. We've all been playing it for three years every single day, and it's suddenly like a whole new thing, because, yeah, i got your character on the entire screen, three other characters playing against you, and... It's just like completely brings the whole thing to life again for me. It's pretty awesome. One of the things that we have working in the online thing is if two skaters collide, whoever has the most momentum is the guy that remains standing. If you run into somebody else in the middle of a, a, a huge trick string, you can wipe their whole score pot clean and you added that bonus into your combo, totally flushing out the create a skater thing. So there's tons of different parts. You can scale your character, change the colors, and basically doing everything we did in the previous games, but more better PS2 online. We're going to be there for Christmas, guys. Hope you like it. Like. All right, so that looked like, you know, I don't remember ever playing Pro Skater 3, but it looks like that might have just been a kind of continuation of what happened in Pro Skater 2. Now, Pro Skater 2 was great and all, but it, Pro Skater 3, Three, if it was just that over again, it didn't really take advantage of what the machine was capable of. The Underground series, that's what everyone loved. NBA Street. There's a couple of these, weren't there? Ben Brickman with EA Sports Big. NBA Street is three on three basketball. The first one to 21 wins the game. But along the way, you're encouraged to do a, as many tricks as you can. It reflects the attitude that's Afro. going on in the street. Uh, the players are just over the top competitors, talk a little trash. How are you going to shoot over this? They make a great shot. They'll point their <laughs> finger and let you know how great they are. You can goaltend. There's no fouls. So it's more kind of, kind of arcadey basketball games. I always found much more entertaining than the sort of simulation basketball games, which always a lot of simulation sports games come across as boring to me. You get this, which seems to be kind of like the, in a sense, a spiritual successor to the NBA Jam series. The game breaker is essentially a tug of war. Say you make a two-point basket, you get two points, your opponent loses two points. There's six unique players which we created, as well as five players from all 30 NBA teams. Oh, NBA that, Street. It's got real Street players in it. It's coming at you on the PlayStation 2 late this June. Go we'll look for it in the store near you. Ace Combat 4. Okay. Um, the first two Ace Combat games I had played, I don't know if I played any ones after that. Hi, I'm Nori Kawada. I'm the U.S. localization producer for Ace Combat 4. I think most users will find it easy to get into the game, unlike most sim games. So it's not as difficult as 
the sim, and yet the realism factor is very high. We've actually used satellite photos to enhance our textures, and we have consultants in the U.S. Air Force as well as the Japanese Self-Defense Force. So overall, I think both players are finding it easy to get into the game and yet enjoy the realism. That looks fantastic for a PlayStation 2 game. That's the thing about flight sims because you can focus a lot of attention on the models of the aircraft and you don't have to put nearly as much attention into the environment, textures, um, geometry, all that kind of stuff. So even on the PlayStation 1 you had some decent looking uh, combat, um, like dog fighting games. And it was especially true when it came to the ones that were based in outer space like Colony Wars or Omega Boots. But moving on to PlayStation 2, I mean, I, w I will, would have looked like that. Uh, looking at that at a quick glance, I wouldn't have guessed it was a PlayStation 2 game. Flight Sims, I mean, I, I enjoy a flight sim from time to time, but I'm not going to count myself as a big fan of it. Devil May Cry, here we go! I think I did an episode of Until I Die with Devil May Cry. Another great uh, Hi, I'm Todd Thornton from Director game. Marketing from Capcom Entertainment. We are today looking at uh, Devil May Cry, the brand new gothic thriller from Akami, who's the creator of the Resident Evil series. It's really the legendary story of Dante, who is a 2,000-year-old part human, part demon. He battles against the devil and trying to fight for the forces of good to save mankind. He has the ability to transform into a demon state where he really can uh, inflict massive attacks. What's great about the game is actually the fast action gameplay. So you're battling with the sword, you're battling with gun. You take a demon, slash him with the sword, at the same time throw him up there, blast him with your guns. The pace of the game is just absolutely amazing. Stunning graphics, it all comes together just for an incredible game experience. Devil May Cry is coming for uh, PlayStation 2 November 14th, so look for it then. It's going to be a great release. Devil May Cry, oh my god. A, they call it, what did they call it, stylish action or something like that? Where you had your character, all these acrobatic moves, jumping around and all that kind of stuff, with a third person somewhat detached from the character viewpoint. Somewhat reminiscent of Resident Evil, in fact the game began its development life as a Resident Evil game. But it, it definitely... It was like the dawning of a new era. You can look at certain games in history that are like, yeah, this is one of those things that, that changed things, and Devil May Cry was one of those. Hurdy Gurdy, don't know what the hell this is. <laughs> Sounds like an insult I'd throw at a redneck. Um, I, I think this crashed. Let's, uh, try that again. There we go. Somebody walking around with an Xbox bag. <laughs> DDR. Never a fan of that. Yeah, Mike Schmidt, I'm a producer here at IOS Interactive. Mike and Schmidt, this huh? This is uh, Hurdy Gurdy, one of our PlayStation 2 titles. IOS. If you uh, play as the character Gurdy, you're a oh, no. menace herder, and you have to learn all sorts of You playing a fucking flute to herd weird little monsters into pens? In order to uh, compete in a tournament at the end of the game against... It looks like they're pointing a camera at a TV for this. Father, That's terrible. Kind of the head main herder of this magical island that you live on. But, um... I don't remember this because I, I can almost guarantee you I've never played it. And it doesn't look like something I'd give a crap. Silent Hill! Silent Hill 2. Oh my god. This is full of awesome e free stuff. That's creepy as shit. <laughs> Because uh, his dead wife, he found a 
lots of monsters. He's scared, but he decided to fly. Thanks to uh, PS2, we can uh, finally express the uh, you know, monster, you know, flashlight, and uh, like a fog. So real. That makes that game so horrifying. That hardware, you know, swept out all over the city. Okay, so. We yeah. can now uh, finally made it. Perfect. Silent Hill 2 on PS2 will come out fall 2001. Why does he look like he was working in a mine? Silent Hill 2, possibly the greatest survival horror game ever made. Gameplay-wise, it's a little iffy. It's awkward to control it. But as far as like the environment and the visuals and all that kind of stuff, it's off the charts. It looks, especially for a PlayStation 2 game, especially a fairly early PlayStation 2 game, it looks phenomenal. I mean, it was really built around what hardware the PlayStation 2 had. And the later versions of it that came out for like the Xbox or, or the PlayStation 3 or the Xbox 360 really do not do it justice. But it's, um, it was a big deal. It's a shame that uh, Konami doesn't know how to do Silent Hill anymore. Metal Gear Solid 2, oh my god, here we go. Another game changer. Hi, my name is Jason Enos from Konami. We're here at the Konami booth checking out Metal Gear Solid 2. This time around, Snake is back and it's fatter than ever. The graphics are insane. The realism is incredible. You can do so many more things with Snake now that you couldn't do with Metal Gear Solid 1. The PlayStation 2's hardware is so powerful that everyone is just awed by this game. The uh, graphics in general are incredible. The level of detail on the environments and the characters are much stronger and more real. I mean, they just look so odd, like human. This is clearly going to take the Metal Gear Solid experience to a whole new level. So gamers, be on the lookout for Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty on the PlayStation 2. This is going to be the hottest game this fall, no question. If you look closely at Metal Gear Solid 2, you see like its character models aren't particularly detailed, its environments aren't especially detailed, but the art direction and the way it was assembled and the technical details and all of that really make for an outstanding looking game and the only the story was kind of nonsense it there's too many betrayals and all that kind of stuff and honestly the gameplay as much as i like the gameplay in its time there wasn't enough of it like if you know what you're doing you will jump from story beat to story beat pretty quickly and you'll spend like 45 seconds to a minute or so actually playing the game between points where you have codec conversations and stuff that last five minutes. But other than that, like, Metal Gear Solid 2 was an incredibly impressive game and really was like a show of force for the PlayStation 2 when it came out. What else do we have? Bulletins. I don't know what this is. Oh, okay. Threads. Oh, it's merch. Um, okay. Oh, okay, these are letters people sent in. Armored Core 2 and Silent Steel Pork with the Island Cable. The Island Cable was what Sony called the, the um, Firewire, or uh, 1394 port, on the PlayStation. It was used as a kind of a link cable between... I, I don't know what it was originally intended for, but the only thing that I think it ended up being used for was a link cable to be used between PlayStations for ne kind of an early version of network play for the PlayStation 2, before the modem was released. And it, um, I never used it for anything, that's for damn sure. <laughs> Sitting on the front of my PlayStation 2, never inserted anything into it. But, whatever. Next transmission, huh? Um, I don't know what the hell I'm looking at here. Tokyo Station! 
Oh, these are the weird Japanese games that will never see a release in the U.S. So I guess it's the Tokyo Game Show. You gonna show us a game or what? Well, here we are at the Tokyo Game Show, E3's Japanese cousin. Now, we could have shown you all the big games that you'll see at E3, but we thought we'd take the proverbial road less traveled. The hell is that? It goes without saying that the Japanese are extremely friendly. They also have a great sense of fashion. Is that what you call that? Not to mention their own unique brand of superheroes. This is the Captain Love game. It isn't just an adventure game, it's a dramatic hero adventure the game. Fuck? You have all those conversations with the heroine and other characters. You use that to progress in the game. So it's not your typical hero thing. You battle using conversation, and there isn't a single scene of violence. No violence? Well, here's a game that involves a flamethrower. Uh, sort of. Oh my god. We've made a game here titled Judge Grilled Meat. The concept of Judge the game is grill meat and serve it to your guests. Grill meat. The preferences of the guests are set like Judge so. Judge Grilled Meat. For example, if one doesn't like carrots, you don't serve that guest carrots. And you serve all the god, guests grilled meat when it's properly done. That raises their degree of satisfaction, and you complete the game. Sounds like a winner. After indulging in that game, you'll probably need this one. This is a I'm diet hungry. simulation machine. You run by operating the special controller, and the calories appear here. So you can <laughs> one, candy, one kilocalorie, and you can see how many kilocalories you've used. Oh my the god. So far. <laughs> it's like a friggin' Peloton bike. <laughs> well, cool and unusual controllers are all the show, but the most breathtaking peripheral had to be this one. This is one of our mini games. As you're we're like we fit that kind of stupid shit. Mic, you're digging deeper and deeper. If you don't make it to the catch your breath level before you run out of air in your lungs, it's game over. We have 15 types of mini games like this. You use the mic so anybody can play easily. We hope you like it. I guarantee you I would not. Couldn't get actual dancers for this, could you? Horse racing. Ah. As the day headed into the home stretch, we stopped by this booth to check out a horse racing game. Uh, Gallop Racer isn't like conventional horse racing games where you raise racing horses. Here, the idea is to get the sensation of actually being a jockey. We've called on the power of the PS2 hardware for the graphics. That seems kind of boring. <laughs> I think they're just about to go into the final corner. At the final corner, you've got to use your whip and make that final spurt. Now they're on the final stretch. They're using their whips, and now they're crossing the finish line. If you do it right, you can take first place. All in all, these games seem pretty cool. Just think twice before you give that diet game to your girlfriend. All right. Broadband. Okay, so. so Twisted Metal Black had an online version, didn't it? Show in Los Angeles, we got a chance to check out the future of the PlayStation 2. Sony announced some cool new technology that will expand its power. Soon you'll be able to connect your PlayStation 2 to the internet, surf the web, and play online against opponents all around the world. And the first of a flurry of announcements, Sony Computer Entertainment and America Online teamed up to bring internet access to the PlayStation 2. The, for the PlayStation developers kit, we're going to create tools so that game developers, so PlayStation 2 developers, can create games that involve dialing into the internet, that use AOL email, that use AOL you, email, bro. And chat. In addition, what you have there is you have the AOL service. You have the AOL welcome screen, all the AOL content, your buddy list. Your AOL list was ass. It is AOL, all running off the of PlayStation. So how will you connect to the internet? I don't know if too like many people did that. PlayStation 2 network adapter, which will be available this November. 
the adapter will include both a V90 modem for people who use a dial-up connection, as well as an Ethernet port for users with broadband connections like cable or DSL. This network adapter will have a suggested retail price of $39.95, a small price to pay for all the features it will make possible. Along with regular internet access and online gameplay, Sony also announced partnerships with Real Networks and Macromedia that will let PlayStation 2 owners access streaming media in the real player and flash format. You have the ability to bring dynamic content from the internet and from various networks into games that are typically located just on static types of media. Clearly, bringing the internet to the PlayStation 2 will open up a world of possibilities, and in the next few years, those possibilities will expand even more. For instance, we saw a demonstration of high-definition video playback on a PlayStation 2, and it was incredible. The PlayStation 2 was playing back HDTV quality video in real time from a hard drive. So how will you be able to get HDTV movies on your PlayStation 2 hard drive? Simply download it from the network. In the future, if we get the high bandwidth of the networking system, so instead of the playback from the hard drive, so you can see the uh, such kind of movie from the network in real time. Wow, streaming HDTV video. It's going to be a whole new game for PlayStation 2 owners with the system's new online capabilities. Stay tuned for more details. The amazing online future of the PlayStation 2 will start this November. This was the early days of online connectivity for game consoles. There were earlier things like the Dreamcast had some measure of online connectivity, but I never met anybody who had a really good experience with it. And then there was things like Sega Channel and X-Band. Um, what was this, a Teleview or something for the Super Famicom? I don't know. But nothing really clicked properly until you saw Xbox Live. So this was maybe the best example. What Sony put together for the PlayStation 2 was maybe the best example of consoles being online until Microsoft released the Xbox. And it was cumbersome, let's say, let's just call it that. You had to buy a separate modem and network adapter to plug into the back of the PlayStation. And it's pretty clear that Sony had envisioned this being an improvement to the PlayStation 2 design from before it released because there was always a either like a PCM CIA slot or a um, just an external like a, a big drive bay with some proprietary connector intended for the network adapter since the thing launched. What the hell else were you going to use this for if not for a hard drive and a and a, a network adapter? So they were clearly intending this to be there from the beginning, but it wasn't included in the hardware. So you needed to buy that separate. You also needed to buy a hard drive separate if you ever planned on using that. I never had one. But it uh, the big problem that ended up there being with the PlayStation 2 network service was that there was no unifying way, unified way of logging on to like the PlayStation network and then using that to access whatever game you wanted to play. Like if I was going to play SOCOM, I'd have to get on SOCOM. I would have to log on with my SOCOM specific credentials, username and password. Then I would get on SOCOM there, play that game. Now let's say I wanted to switch to EverQuest, I'd have to, of course, pull that disc out, put the EverQuest disc in, log on with my EverQuest specific username and password resident evil out online outbreak um, same thing specific credentials for that there was no one logon for everything you needed to do and you needed to type it in manually if you didn't have a keyboard that was a nightmare and honestly they didn't have there wasn't a lot of like infrastructure on the back end or even on the console side for significant patches for games that have already been released. I remember SOCOM had a certain map where there was a a um, objective where you bomb something. And you go and you plant the bomb there and the game will glitch out. It just doesn't work. They couldn't do anything about that because it was a problem on the disc. It's a shame they couldn't fix that before the game released, but they just didn't have... It just 
they couldn't do anything about it because the PlayStation 2 didn't have any capability for it. It didn't have like a hard drive like the PlayStation 3, the 360, the PS4, the PS5, whatever, as to patch games post-release. I think um, the EverQuest game had a very small capacity for that because you could save things on the memory card. And Final Fantasy XI had that capacity because it had it required the use of the hard drive, which you could save data to, you could save game data to, and all that kind of stuff. But for the most part, like they had a hard time doing anything post-launch to PlayStation 2 games. And honestly, I believe that was a problem that the Xbox had as well for its online components, because Although the Xbox had a hard drive, it wasn't used for game data, I don't think. Although I could be wrong about that. It's been a long time since I touched an Xbox. Anyway, I mean, it, I'm still going to call it early days of online connectivity for games, even though it was not early as in, like, early, early. Um, is that it? Finally, that is it. Man, that was an hour and 53 minutes. Jeez. Wow. I'm going to have to split this into more than one episode. Two or three at least. Anyway, yeah. thanks for watching.